The following podcast contains explicit language. You're listening to the Cinematography Podcast presented by Hot Rod Cameras, a program about the art, craft and philosophy of the moving image and the people who make it happen. Coming to you from the world headquarters of Hot Rod Cameras in Hollywood, California, are your hosts, Ben Rock and Ilya Friedman. Hey, the gang's all here. How's it going, Ilya? How's it going, Alana? Great. Yeah, it's going. Who do we have on the show today? Well, we actually have a couple of people from the Academy Award nominated movie, Fire of Love. And Alana did that interview. Who's on? Who did you interview? I interviewed the documentary director, Sarah Dosa, and her editors were Jocelyn Chapu and Aaron Casper. And basically, the editors worked with Sarah really closely on putting the documentary together. They also helped write the script because everything in the doc almost is archival footage. Yeah, it's all uh, comprised of footage that the two subjects themselves filmed, uh, husband and wife volcanologist team. It's a really interesting movie. When I watched it, I was like, uh, if Wes Anderson made a documentary about a husband and wife volcanologist team, it would look a lot like this. Like it was very uh, center punched in the composition. It, there was kind of a wittiness to the way they filmed themselves. It was really interesting. And you can currently watch it, I think, on uh, Disney Plus on the National Geographic side. I, I love that National Geographic is releasing stuff like this because on the one hand, this is very much National Geographic kind of material. It's scientists in the field doing sciencey stuff. And on the other side, this has a lot of uh, it's quirky. It's got a real personality to it. Uh, Miranda July is the voiceover person for it. Like, it's a little unusual, a little bit off the beaten path for, you know, what is usually Nat Geo's stock and trade, which are like straightforward nature documentaries. This has, it's not an edge, but it's got kind of an angle. It's it's very interesting. Yeah, we talk about that in the interview. Basically, they were, Sarah was very influenced by the French New Wave because mm. when the footage was shot by Maurice Kraft, mostly as a cinematographer, it was at that time of the French New Wave in the early 70s. Oh. Yeah, exactly. I guess it would be. I didn't think about that. We'll get to that in the interview, but let's talk about our close focus. We have, well, yeah, uh, I think, a really, I kind of overrode everybody and, and kind of stormed in and said, we have to do this for close focus. Uh, a most unusual thing. Well, we've talked on here before about Corridor Digital, which they're uh, VF, a bunch of VFX guys. They have an amazing YouTube channel called Corridor Crew. They do things like VFX artists react. And I've actually learned a lot watching them. They do they bring on stunt people and have stunt people talk about their stunts. And then they sometimes do these like really weird visual experiment kind of videos or explainer kind of videos. And they did one that they released this week that I'm sure was like a few months in the making where they created an anime called Rock, Paper, Scissors that you can watch on their channel that looks for all the world like anime, but they filmed it live action against green screen with themselves doing all the live action stuff and then ran it through AI to make it look like anime. And I believe they used mostly stable diffusion. I don't, I'm not sure if they used mid journey or not. And they talk a little bit about like the various techniques they used. And then if you subscribe to their, their real service, if you go to their website, they explain like the exact recipe that they used to get the results they got. But ultimately what they did was create something that to me looks, if I didn't know better, I would just have assumed it was an anime or it was something that was done in a style of anime, but it was animation. Somebody had hand drawn these images, but it has all been run through AI. And it's the first time that I've seen a moving video AI project looked at it and said like, oh, that actually could like, I don't know about threatening jobs, but I'm like, that could be a style that you could make a regular animated series or movie or shorts or whatever you wanted to do. You could use these techniques and you could make something. And as a viewer, I'm just watching it. I feel like I'm watching a really cool cartoon. What were your responses? I'd say that uh, it reminded me a lot of the sort of waking life effect, the over overlay. But I know that that required a lot of human effort and a lot of tweaking. And the fact that, and I'm not saying that, you know, the rock, paper, scissors didn't have you know, the human element because certainly in, the, in their video, it looked like they said they spent two months on it. I don't doubt it. I think a huge portion yeah. of that was probably spent on perfecting their testing. And, and yeah, he, R&D. Here's what yeah. I really uh, appreciate about Quarter Crew. I really appreciate that 
they kind of get to do their own thing and they kind of get to be their own Skunk Works development team. They get to uh, constantly pioneer different ways of getting the result they want to. And I, I feel like if they had just been a traditional Hollywood VFX house, they would have so many requirements for clients that they couldn't do that. But because they answer to YouTube, because they answer to their fans, because they have this, you know, very different revenue stream, I want to say they get to fuck around because it seems like they get to fuck around when I watch their channel. It seems like, oh, we kind of mess with this. We kind of do this. But it's not just fucking around. They, they really are serious and come up with some really cool stuff. And I really appreciate the real time sort of AI videos that they did in the past. And I really like how they continue to use very, uh, you know, modest tools to create really incredible effects and put it forth to the world. And uh, they say so in their video, how this is open source information. These are open source tools that they're using. So they want to contribute to the open source community and tell everyone what it is that they did. And I have huge respect for this. I think it's immensely positive and I know it's going to be inspirational to the people out there who would like to make an animated series, whether or not it's an anime style. You, it looks to me like you could do so many different styles with this. I mean, it basically is endless and your human beings, uh, in theory, don't necessarily need to be good at every part of acting because essentially they had voice actors who could have done all the voices. It didn't have to be them. And then the human aspect of it were literally like pantomiming puppets. It's brilliant. Mm. I, I loved watching it from beginning to end. It's really fun. And then I uh, went and watched the short. So, yeah, I think that Corridor Crew really hit the nail on the head with this one. It's definitely, I predict, a video that's going to go viral amongst uh, animators and the animation community. And I can't wait to hear the feedback. And I, I have to imagine there's going to be some lower budget anime houses probably out of Japan right now. Or they're going like, holy crap, how can we streamline our workflow? How can we rely less on some artists and be able to, you know, possibly use some of these tools to do our in-betweens or who, who knows? Because like yeah. in-betweening was always the, one of those. The, the joke's yeah, on them because yeah. if they get rid of their artists, they're still going to have to film everything with actors and camera. Oh, sure. I'm not saying completely lose them. But I think that for someone who's just starting out, who maybe has a team of four they now could possibly compete with a team of, you know, 40, which I think is incredible. Now, of course, they chose anime, I think, uh, very thoughtfully because anime is a style where, you know, every single frame isn't animated. And although there might be a lot of detail in certain drawings, there's like a lot of stuff that is kind of foreshortened when you look at a, you know, a speed racer kind of a cartoon, like, you know, the animation is more spare now also like when i talk about speed racer i'm talking about animation the from this yeah not not the not the wachowski speed racer but you know you're talking about from the 60s and 70s or like scooby-doo kind of stuff those kinds of styles would be eminently easy to copy for stable diffusion or mid journey what these guys figured out how to do though was you know when you talk about the waking life look you know frame by frame everything changing and if you look at it like you'll see their hair is changing a little bit frame by frame and that's because the ai is generating a new frame so they're literally filming it they're cutting it they're generating an image sequence like a target image sequence and running each frame through stable diffusion and they figured out some ways to make them all feel like one of a piece or that the movement is, is happening. And I think it's inevitable that those tools are going to start to have video processing in them. So they'll have optical flow and they'll have stuff like that that'll make this process automatic. And the Corridor Crew guys are almost hacking the software to make it give them what they want. One day you'll just do it. So yes, uh, my, my prediction is, is it won't be long before the stable diffusions and the like just literally have a knob so that once you've chosen your parameters, your prompt, it's going to apply that same parameters and prompt to every single image in the sequence so that it feels uh, it feels like it's all coming out of the same thing. And that they're going to make it easier. They're going to make it easier and easier and easier. And shit, man, yeah. I, I don't know what's going to happen. It's going to be, uh, you know, someone will type something into chat GPT. And then it's going to connect with stable diffusion. And it's like, oh, did you want to see the animated version of what you just <laughs> prompted us with bloop there it is you know i i don't know how long that will take but it's uh you know uh, i can my crystal ball looking into the future is like wow this is gonna get real interesting real fast well and i've been kind of saying all along with uh ai art that it's like if i write the phrase hell is filled with meat clowns into mid journey and it gives me some disturbing images i'm not an artist i didn't create that but in this case, they were literally storyboarding, filming, creating a film like by hand, 
the old fashioned way and then running it through here. So this just becomes, you know, sort of a very elaborate filter. It is. That it's, they've, a, it's a that they've hugely invented. elaborate filter that they've put on top of it, then added some 2D you know, and 3D visual effects. And voila, they've ended up with something that feels familiar, but is also completely original on how they got there, which I'm blown away and impressed. Well, it sounds yeah, yeah, like it's being used more like what people would like AI to be used for, which is really just as an assist rather than, you know, taking over. I agree. I, I think that when people are like, well, you're not going to use real actors, I always scoff at that. It's like, well, if actors aren't doing the acting, someone's doing the acting. I feel like we talk about Uncanny Valley if you're looking at the Polar Express or something like that, you know, like older CGI animated movies that were using motion capture, but there's something kind of dead in the eyes of the on-screen characters. But I think, you know, you want to see real uh, soul death, have an AI animate a character and also voice it. Like, it's not going to feel real. It might be entertainingly surreal to mess around with that. But a chat GPT script written for an AI that's completely voiced and animated and, and has no human in it. Uh, yeah, that's not, that's not going to be good. But with this, you have real actors, real performance, a real script that they wrote. And I actually found the short itself, like if I didn't know anything about it, I found the short itself was just entertaining. And I look forward to seeing what some rando in some country that, you know, I don't even speak their language. I don't know very much about them. But somebody gets a hold of the software and creates a completely unexpected, really cool short, filming everything on their phone and then plugging it into, into these things and creating something that's like a, a story that you never would have been able to tell any other way. I expect more of that because, again, you could plug in any style you could say you know in the style of toy story if you wanted you could you know it wouldn't be as good right now but give it time you know i, I agree and i think that the ai is going to get better and better at lip sync because you know uh, clearly uh, lip sync is not 100 percent in rock paper scissors but there are moments in that where clearly it's really really good there are people who have been for some time now working on automatic processes to uh, match lip sync for like Netflix because, yeah. you know, Netflix has got their programming dubbed into, you know, 20, 30 different languages sometimes. And all the extra work that the voice actors and talent have to do, but no matter what, the lip sync is going to not exactly work with every single language. But I've seen some demonstrations from some really impressive companies that are working on an automated process for that, where the actor's mouth is actually using AI is changed and the lip sync becomes what really, really accurate, no matter what language they're speaking. There's a couple of samples of that online right now, too. It's mind blowing. It's worth looking at. And I think that is our future. Very interesting to see how long it takes before certain big stars now appear to be completely fluent in every language and their mouth matching that uh, perfectly. Oof. Yeah. Anyway. Brave New World. <laughs> Brave New so World. So let's go ahead and get into Alana's interview with the team behind Fire of Love. Let's do it. Yep. The Cinematography Podcast Interview. I'm joined by Fire of Love director Sarah Dosa and editors Aaron Casper and Jocelyn Chaput. Welcome and congrats on the Oscar nomination. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. So first of all, like for our viewers who haven't seen it yet, how would you describe Fire of Love for Sarah? For me, uh, I would describe Fire of Love as the story of two intrepid scientists, Katya and Maurice Kraft, who fall in love in the late 60s over there shared uh, passion for volcanoes and they decide to dedicate their lives to exploring the mysteries of the planet by documenting volcanic eruptions. They died together in an eruption in 1991, but Fire of Love uses um, their extraordinary footage that they took over their nearly 20 years of volcano running uh, to tell this story, not just of their lives, but of, of their love for each other and for the planet. Yes. And so I was curious, like, how did you first find out about the crafts, Maurice and Katya? Yeah. Um, so uh, Aaron and I, we were actually finishing the, the last film that I directed, which is a film called The Seer and the Unseen, which tells the story of an Icelandic woman who is in communication with spirits of nature. And we wanted to open that film with archival imagery of erupting volcanoes in Iceland. And so once we started doing that research, that's actually when we came across Katya and Maurice Kraft. Because not, not that many people had, uh, you know, shot erupting volcanoes in Iceland, but Katya and Race spectacularly did. 
once we learned that they were a married couple, that they were in love with each other and the earth, that, that was extremely intriguing to us. But Jocelyn actually came across them very early in, in her life. So I'll let her talk about her first encounter with, with the crafts. Yeah, go ahead, Jocelyn. Tell us a little bit about that. Sure. An uncle of mine gave us one of their books when we were kids. Um, my siblings and I, I don't remember how old I was, but that book was a staple in our home. And the, I mean, it had pictures in it, a lot of text, of course, but then all, all these illustrations. It was really a wonderful book to grow up with. So, yes. How did you come on to the project? Well, I, I had been an admirer of Sarah's work for years since I saw the last season when it played in Toronto at Hot Dog. And I moved to the Bay Area and, and I knew she was based there. And I finally had a chance to meet her at my sister-in-law's wedding. I do remember Sarah telling me back then that she was researching the crafts and thinking she might want to make a film about them. And I think two or three years later, it turns out she was going to make a film about them and needed a demo editor to put together a, a sort of a sample of the film and, you know, its flavors and uh, whatnot. And so I worked on that demo. And then when it came time to editing the full picture, um, for a number of reasons, the whole team decided that they wanted two editors. And so I became the second editor. But luckily for me. So when it came down to doing the documentary, how, Sarah, how did you guys get access to all the footage? Yeah, well, we did We had to figure out first where the, um, the bulk of the archival material resided, as it has actually changed hands through the years. Um, the archive was largely stewarded by Bertrand Kraft, who is Maurice's older brother, as well as other friends and family members through the years. But um, when we began working on Fire of Love, the archive resided in an archival facility called Image Est that's based in France. One of our producers, Ina Fitchman, was able to get um, kind of a, a licensing deal with Image Est. Luckily, Bertrand, you know, he, he needed to approve our approach and, and he liked our direction for the film, which is kind of this love triangle approach. So Bertrand signed off on it uh, as did Image Est. And then Image Est, which began the process of digitally scanning the footage for us, and just beautifully scanning everything, sending it to us through an FTP site for us to download. At the same time, we were working with this amazing archival researcher named Nancy Marcotte, who's based outside of Montreal. And she was gathering all the other archives that were outside of, the, you know, with the crafts that shot on 16 millimeter footage. And so that is why it's anytime the crafts appeared on television, whether it was on the news, reporting on volcanic eruptions uh, that were happening around the world. Or being on variety shows, uh, which was really fun for us, especially those like these very stylized 1970s variety shows. But they were really kind of thought of as uh, celebrities in France. They had a following. Uh, people really adored them. And so that meant that they showed up in, in the public record, um, not infrequently. And so Nancy's research, uh, getting those materials too, was instrumental to our, to our process of collecting footage and, and learning about them and, and then developing the story. What was it like trying to kind of carve out a story from all this extensive footage that there was? Um, this is Erin. Pardon the pun, but it really was a blast. It was just such a process of discovery for us. There was about two to 250 hours of um, scanned material from Imagest, and it arrived in batches. And so every batch that came over the course of several months really felt like a holiday, you know, it was <laughs> And um, we would download everything as quickly as we could and then just take off running through the footage and discovering new material and new shots. And the biggest challenge was that the material didn't have any sync sound. It was all arrived to us, all completely silent. So that was an additional challenge, along with the thousands and thousands of 16, scanned 16 millimeter shots that were in the archive. What kind of shape was the footage in when you guys had it? Did you need to do any clean, a lot of cleanup or? The footage was in excellent shape. It was so lovingly cared for by the archivists at Image Est. We actually got to meet one of them uh, last week in London. And it was really special because I just became so fond of them. And I just admire the role of archivists in society. So yeah, they, they did such a wonderful job not only caring for it, but scanning it for us and scanning it with so much care. We didn't do any cleanup. If anything, we decided to keep certain scratches or like if you were to play the film frame by frame. Now, this is like a very obscure Easter egg, but you might find one little wax crayon marking in the whole film. 
because the crafts, they also edited their films when they were alive. And so all of that had been scanned and including the outs. And so um, we have, to, there's at least one moment in the film where there's a wax crayon marking. That, and I understand you guys collaborated then, you and Sarah and Aaron all collaborated together for script writing too. Yeah, the, the three of us, along with one of our producers, Shane Boris, um, all four of us wrote the narration together. Um, it was a very dynamic and deeply collaborative process that had many different phases to it. From the very beginning, actually, I should say, we didn't want narration for Fire of Love. We were hoping that the archival material could just speak for itself. However, then we encountered just the tremendous challenges uh, with the material, despite being so beautiful and, and rich. Uh, there was many challenges from not having sync sound for the 16 millimeter footage. And also the fact that there was no kind of classic or conventional imagery of a love story. And for us, a love story felt like the truest interpretation of their legacy based on all the research that, that we did. So we, we realized that we needed a different narrative vehicle to communicate that. And we thought narration could be the appropriate vehicle for that. We had various influences. For example, the French New Wave was kind of a guiding star for us. The, as you know, the French New Wave inspired Katia and Maurice. So all to say what influenced them, we wanted to also influence us. But yeah, at first, the narration was very expository. It was kind of like, it got us from here to there. And that was useful when we were kind of just mapping out the plot of the film. But this wasn't a film just about plot. This was a film about scenes of time and place of unknown and understanding. And so we needed to kind of restructure and find a uh, voice for narration that could match kind of Katya and Rice's own process of discovery. They could feel just as curious as they were and ask questions rather than proclaim answers. And so that began to really kind of shape our, our process. Yeah, I mean, I was kind of curious. Did Was there any thought to doing like more of a traditional thing with interviews at all rather than just as background within it? We, we didn't want to do that actually from an early phase of making Fire of Love uh, for, for a number of reasons. We wanted the archival material to speak for itself as, as much as possible, but it was really important to kind of the world building of Fire of Love to try to situate the audience and kind of the time and place that they were in to try and be lock and step with Tati and Maurice as they were going through their own process of discovery. And of course, there's a few exceptions of that. Like at the beginning, we, we say that they, you know, tomorrow will be their last day and we kind of jump ahead in time. But by and large, we really wanted to situate the audience in the present as much as possible. And if we had talking head kind of interviews come in, that would break that sense of temporality because they would be reflecting on the past from the perspective of the future. We also wanted to keep the story like a tight and intimate around like this love triangle of Katia and Race and volcanoes. And so uh, we didn't want to kind of erase the experience um, and the knowledge of their friends and collaborators who knew them best. But we felt like bringing in that knowledge through the narration could be a more uh, direct way to access it that kept this kind of tight focus around the three characters. And just lastly, like Katia and Marisa, kind of these mythic characters, so to speak. They lived in this larger than life existence. And we wanted to nod to that kind of expansive, mythic, majestic way in the world. And there was many kind of trappings of mythic storytelling that, that we wove in and, and magic realism, so to speak. All to yeah, say, like the animation sequences were, were really exactly. fun. Exactly, yeah. And I know Wes Anderson is influenced by French New Wave also, but it did actually remind me quite a bit of like a Wes Anderson movie to some extent. I don't know if that was an influence for you or not for a possible look maybe or... We we studied, we watched the Royal Tenenbaums a few times as an example of narration. But yeah, it was really the French New Wave was the biggest influence for us. And and people, you know, in, in, since the film has come out, have made the Wes Anderson comparison. But I think it's because we mostly share the same reference points. Uh, there's a few shots in the film, though, that were just undeniably made us think of some of his films. Like there's a shot of the Le Quitte Valcain, you know, the, the band of collaborators that they worked with, um, especially in, in the very early 70s. There's a shot of them coming down this mountain all together, all like outfitted in this way. We're like, that's the Wes Anderson shot, you know? Yeah, so, honestly, the costume, yeah. some of the things that they were wearing were like straight out of a Wes Anderson movie, <laughs> like in within their own time, you know, in the in, within the footage that they shot themselves. I just thought it was yeah. funny. We've always wondered, like he must have known, Wes Anderson must have known about the crafts. Like it seems like there's so much in his own work. Of, of course, uh, Jacques Cousteau also has that fun costuming and has that fun kind of performative adventurer element to his own work. But, but yeah, I've wanted to ask 
Wes, you know, have, have you seen the crafts? He, he must have. Um, but we, we enjoy those jokes very much. Yeah, that was pretty funny. So I, I was curious. So tell me a little bit about Maurice and Katya themselves as cinematographers. I know that they, you know, made several films themselves. Like Maurice made like 10 films, I think, about volcanoes, you know, that were within his lifetime. I was just thinking about how Maurice always liked to say that He's not a filmmaker. He's a volcanologist who is forced to make films to in order to wander. And I just like I think that I think uses all of us because he's so incredibly accomplished and is such an artist. Both of them are such incredible artists. And, you know, it's it's very funny to me. But I I think that their work is so special. I mean, and Maurice and, and I think of Katya's one thing that I think is important to not leave out is Katya's photography. Which, you know, I, w- I so wish we could have included more of in the film, um, but we tried where we could. In addition to the 200 to 250 hours of archival 15 millimeter footage, Katia also took, I think, somewhere in the neighborhood of 300,000 photos in their time, too. And while their imagery is just breathtaking, it also provided, it was a data set to other volcanologists um, so they could learn. So many volcanologists we learned actually don't go out into the field. They're what Marisa called, Katia called desk volcanologists. And so there's such immense scientific purpose behind their imagery. Um, yeah, I'll add that um, I, th- I think we're all absolutely in awe of their cinematography yeah. and photography. And it very much reflected not just their love for volcanoes and for planet Earth, but um, a palpable uh, kind of sense of curiosity radiated behind the frame and also depicted the world as sentient, you know, as, as alive. I remember like the very first reel I looked at was from Hawaii in 1984. And there were these close-ups of the lava where I just kept thinking, this lava looks alive. Like this is a being, this is a monster, like, a, but like an enchanting monster. And that perception of everything on earth as interconnected and and alive, really, you could feel that palpably through their imagery. And I think that's such a skill as a cinematographer to impress your own perspective through the lens. Uh, the other thing, too, that used to infuriate Katya was that Maurice had like this intense fear of missing a shot. You know, he would try to capture everything from every angle to document the, you know, the once in a lifetime phenomena of volcanic activity. And also because that was in his nature, that was very much his personality. And you can feel that thirst and that hunger in his cinematography and certainly Katya too. But um, I should say that her background actually, that as a child, she was a very talented painter. And in a book that her mother authored, her mom talks about Katya's compositions and that artful eye from a very young age. And that shows up in her photography. And there's certain frames that, yeah, are just absolutely breathtaking. That They remind me of Dali paintings, but they're surreality. Or you can really see the figures in the lava, you know, where she's clearly seeing, for example, her favorite photograph is called uh, Pele dancing and Pele being the, the Hawaiian goddess of creation expressed through volcanic activity. And there's this beautiful lava flow that really looks like this goddess dancing in the lava. So she just had this eye towards art as she's capturing kind of the scientific data of her photography too. And so that pairing of two of them together, um, yeah, they're, they're celebrated scientists in their day, but I love now that people are embracing them as true artists, too. Yeah, it's true. It seemed like they really melded the idea of science and art with looking at volcanoes that way. It's very it's beautiful. It really is. Do you think for their legacy that they uh, really do you think people have a much better understanding today than of volcanoes? And, you know, I know one of the things that they were really got concerned about was um, safety and countries making sure that people were evacuating when when they could see the warning signs. So do you think the world is different now with that their legacy has made a difference for that? I think there have been extraordinary advances in technology, both in terms of the science of volcanology as well as in communication technologies. And at the same time, I think that there's devastating political and economic factors that have inhibited progress uh, in terms of saving lives. I think uh, we devastatingly saw what happened in Syria and Turkey just the past few weeks with the earthquakes there. And those, of of course, earthquakes cannot be avoided. That's earth processes right there. However, all kinds of political and economic factors got in the way of implementing communication systems, warning systems, but there's still these systems that Katyn Reese experienced with Nevada del Reese in 1985 that continue today. 
what I find so interesting about the point in time where Katya and Maurice were volcanologists, and maybe this goes for, for so many scientific fields, is that often it's not just their, their careers, but it, it represents this evolution of the field, this point in the evolution of our understanding of volcanoes. Um, so they were active between the late 60s and right up until 1991. And there was so much going on in volcanology then, and there's so much going on in volcanology today. And, and yet what, what the kind of science they were doing and the, the field work they were doing uh, is probably not, it is not the field work that's being done today. And I, I just love that idea. And they were very much aware of that themselves and, and paying attention to what had come before them as far as our understanding. And so there's something, the archive they left behind is not just a geologic phenomena, but it's also of a time in the history of volcanology that we likely won't see again. I mean, everything down to the equipment they used and the different methodologies. But I, I enjoy thinking about that. Um, my brother's a volcanologist and I think technically a geophysicist, but he studies volcanoes. Um, he does field work, but he also spends a lot of time with these uh, like supercomputers just running processes based on data collected. And it's, um, it looks very different. And yet it's so much informed by Katya and Maurice's work when they were volcanologists. And, you know, thanks to their imagery, we have such a better sense of, of what volcanoes look like. And we can still study that imagery today. Katya and Maurice, their imagery was not only data and not only art, but it was also like the, the way that they were capturing those images and the way that they were able to work on the field was very innovative. I mean, to take that camera equipment into those conditions and come back with your images intact is remarkable, especially where like there were acidic gases and the heat itself would melt the camera. And they really devised all kinds of methods for not only capturing the images, but making sure those images survive. Yeah, that's, I know, the part about him, like, being on the raft in the lake with, of acid, I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> that was, like, the ner most nerve-wracking part. <laughs> and I'm like, he's like, I want to take a rowboat down a lava flow someday. <laughs> it's like, wow. <laughs> <Anyway>. <laughs> and um, thanks so much for coming on the Cinematography Podcast, and good luck at the Academy Awards. Pretty exciting, right? Thank you. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. That was the team behind Fire of Love. That was great. Ben, guess what time it is? Uh, what is it? I, 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 uh, uh, what? It's short end time. Whoa. And now, short ends. Yeah, yeah I, I, I threw, I for threw a loop, you. Cause, yeah, cause I know, I did. I usually, I've got, I've got certain vocal prompts, yeah. which then, uh, just like AI, made your brain spin. I know. Like, oh man, what am I going to do right now? No, uh, it's, it's short end time. It's our obsession of I'm, I'm just the so, moment. I'm so trained week. like a Pavlov dog. Like if you rang a bell, I would just start drooling right here. <laughs> <laughs> so Ben, what, what is, uh, what is your obsession? What are you into? Uh, Alana pointed me to something that uh, made me very, very happy and actually is a really interesting story. And that's that Pi, Darren Aronofsky's first movie shot by friend of the show, Maddie Lee Batik. And if you were to come to my house right now, the only movie poster hanging in my house is Pi. It's like an eight foot Pi poster. Anyway. Well, except for Alien Raiders right there oh, next to you oh, in oh, your office. Oh, that's true. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, that's true. A but I mean, like... A I Alien Raiders is Ben's movie. Yeah, so, of course. Of course. He's, he's, he's got... Yeah, I got to have my own movie. Happen. But but no, but the only... Yeah. Anyway, Pi was a movie that came out in 1998. I was a projectionist at an art house movie theater in Orlando called Enzion. If you find yourself in Orlando, Florida, check out whatever's at the Enzion. It's a great theater. And I became obsessed with Pi. I would come in on my day off and watch it. I thought it was just brilliant. And it's like a $60,000 science fiction story that's like deeply internal and involves weird Jewish mysticism and math and the Kabbalah and the stock market, all kinds of crazy shit all kind of mashed together. And it looks great. Shot on black and white reversal, I believe Tri-X. And I, I even remember reading that, like, they took inspiration from Frank Miller's Sin City for the look that they went for. Not the movie, because that movie didn't come out for many more years, but the original comic book, which is, like, black or white. Like, all ink or all paper. Like, very little else. Gorgeous film. So, this is what I didn't know. So, uh, Artisan had put out Pi, which Artisan was later acquired by Lionsgate. And then the Blair Witch Project, which I worked on, like, a year later was acquired by artisan as well so when darren aronofsky sold pie to artisan 
it was only for 25 years. Usually when you sell a movie, I, I really kind of want to know more about this deal. When you sell a movie to a studio, if you make a movie and you sell it to whoever, like they basically publish that movie forever. It's theirs. They yeah. own it. In the, perpetuity. In it, perpetuity. Yeah, yeah. They might get bought out by somebody and now it's theirs, much like Artisan was bought out by Lionsgate. But for whatever reason, Darren Aronofsky, the right, all the rights to the movie reverted back to him 25 years later. And that's right now. Because I'm elderly and 25 years ago was the late 90s. Ugh. Yep. Oh, yeah. Jesus fucking Christ. So um, anyway, uh, so A24, who basically A24 is sort of what is the much more successful version of what Artisan was then today. A24 puts out movies like X and Pearl and everything everywhere all at once. And, you know, yeah. l- lots of we've talked to lots of people on the show. They're having a moment. for sure. Yeah. A24 is pretty amazing right now. And Pi, I mean, Aronofsky kind of fits right in there with them. Didn't they put out, did they put out the whale? Yes. Yeah. So He has a deal with them. So obviously he's got a good relationship with them. So they're re-releasing it. But when you read the, it was like a release that Aronofsky himself put out. They got the original elements, like the original film elements, and which it was 16 millimeter Tri-X reversal film. They rescanned mm-hmm. it at 8K. Now, I've always been under the impression, and maybe Ilya, you can set me straight on this, that 16 millimeter film is basically maxes out at about 2K resolution. So what would the virtue of scanning it at 8K be? Oversampling. And it kind of depends. 16 millimeter uh, can have a tremendous amount of resolution hidden in there because lenses, which are used for 16, are almost always universally sharper lenses than are used for 35. But that being said, usually the grain structure counteracts and destroys your ability to be able to get all of that resolution out onto the big screen. But if you did expose it very carefully and you have a really thick negative, and let me tell you, I know Pi uh, definitely, I think the noise is part of the aesthetic yeah. of that yeah, movie. Yeah, the grain is sure. part of the character of that movie. So. You could scan it at 8K and have some very, very large files. You'll know you'll get every single bit of data that you can out of that little tiny frame. Although I'm not aware of an 8K 16 millimeter size gate out there. I'm sure that it might have been an 8K scanner, but it probably the amount of usable resolution was significantly less. This is a guess, a theory on my part. I, I don't know exactly which scanner it was, but uh, there's not many 8K scanners. Very, very few. You can count them essentially in operation now, I think on like one or two hands. It's, it's really not many. So I'm not exactly sure about all of the details that go into that, but it probably was overkill. The amount that you can really see, you're right. You probably can't see you probably can't see all of that information in this particular case if you had a scientifically exposed negative and you tried really really hard you could probably get beyond 2k but i i couldn't tell you an exact number of how much it's probably in the the mid threes at the at best well i'm still very interested so they're releasing it on pi day it's mm-hmm. going to be playing i believe in imax theaters which is a very interesting idea to go see a movie that was shot in 16 millimeter in IMAX. And they also like went back to the original audio elements. They remastered everything. Uh, As someone who, uh, again, I have seen this movie. uh, If you told me I'd seen this movie 30 times, I would believe you. And I feel like I know what it looks like. I was the projectionist. I was handling the film. I was looking at it, you know, on the, on a big screen when it first came out. I'm very, very interested to see if it feels like the same, if it feels refreshed in any way or different in any way. I'm sure that they're going to release it on a 4K Blu-ray or whatever for dorks like me who are obsessive about this film so that we can watch it on our on our big screens at home as well. But anyway, they're re-releasing it on Pi Day if you're an Aronofsky fan. Which is March 14th. March 14th. Sorry, yeah. Sorry, I, I keep... Uh, I assume everyone knows what Pi Day is. But yeah, <laughs> Pi no. Day is... Uh, because Pi is 3.14, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, Pi Day is March 14th. So on March 14th, you will be able to see it in the theater, depending on where you are. But I'm assuming since we're in L.A., I'll probably be able to check it out. So that is my short end. Alana, what is your short end today? Well, talking about AI stuff, kind of again, <laughs> in the zeitgeist right now still, I've been messing around with it a little bit, too. In kind of in the vein of the same idea of using ChatGPT as an assist 
just to kind of try it out, just to see what was what. I gave it some prompts to write some of our show notes and information, and I tend to write rather lengthy descriptions of the show, and there's a lot of information in there. So I decided, well, let's see if I can make this process a little bit, you know, shorter, because it always takes a little bit of time. I first tried it for the episode we did with Florian Hoffmeister on TAR, and it was completely wrong and didn't give me any accurate information <laughs> at <Really>? all <laughs> when I told it to tell me about, you know, the movie Tar and Florian Hoffmeister is a cinematographer, blah, blah, blah. It just made some bullshit up, basically. I'm like, okay, that didn't work. Most recently, then, I, ha- I typed in, write a blog about the AMC Plus show Interview with the Vampire. This time, when I told it to write a blog post specifically, it gave me quite a long thing of information about that particular show, which was interesting. I didn't use it. I used ideas from it, though. So what it did is it sort of, you know, did what it does, which is aggregate things from the web and coughed up, you know, sort of a summary for me. I didn't ask it to tell me anything about Jesse Feldman, who was the cinematographer. I just asked it to tell me something about that show in particular, which I knew there would probably be way more information about. Again, though, it, it, the writing was like, let's almost every sentence started with the... Mm. Which, you know, is a no-no if you know anything about writing. <laughs> so I'm just saying, like, I, I did use it as a springboard. So so, so would you say, like, 1% of, of that made it into there, even that much? I would say maybe a sentence. So, a yeah, sentence. perhaps 1%, maybe less. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. So still entirely written by me. <laughs> but anyway, um, all that but aside. But is, is it, like, aggregating all the major information you need so it's just saving you time for having to, like... Yeah. Yeah, it did. I mean, you know, it kind of because usually if I'm if I want to do a description about a show, like if someone isn't familiar with whatever the subject matter of that we're talking about, for instance, when you do the Sundance movies, people haven't seen them yet. So we have to have a description about, well, this movie is about this. You know what I mean? Because Mm -hmm. lots of people aren't haven't seen it. And um, with Interview with the Vampire, you know, it isn't necessarily something that everyone has seen. So I decided we need to have a little bit of a what sentence or two about what is it. But it's interesting because then I read an article this morning about how some people are using it kind of as an assist for their jobs. This guy, actually, a few people are using it kind of in lieu of like doing a Google search. They'll type their search terms into chat GPT instead. And basically it's going to it'll aggregate things faster for them instead of having to then click and go to multiple sites for things. It's easier than for it to be put all in one place. And you can really refine it, too, for closer to what you want. So um, this one guy was a special education teacher, and he asked ChatGPT, like, how could he adapt a basketball court for kids that had cerebral palsy and how to also include kids with autism? in playing basketball for, you know, the, his special needs classes. And he typed that into chat GPT instead of like Google. And basically it gave him a bunch of ideas that were all in one place really quickly. And, and it was much easier for him to make a plan for mm. his course or for his teaching things and writing up like a proposal for what he needed to make this basketball court than just going and surfing the web for all the answers. So, interesting. I don't know. I thought that was interesting. I like hearing I like hearing yeah. positive stories about this because all you hear about is you know how Bing tried to get the guy to leave his wife and uh, you know ma- ma- <laughs> marry it. You know it got us all talking about Bing. <laughs> so Ilya, what is your short end this week? All right. Well, uh, I think I'm going to be the one who brings us all a little bit down, and nothing like bringing everyone yeah. down right at the end end of an episode. But um, two weeks ago on the show. Uh, we talked about how Two Guns was the number one movie on Netflix, which is, you know, it was a little bit crazy because it came out, you know, a decade ago. And wasn't like a touchstone, like, you know, did well, but, you know, did respectably, but wasn't, you know. Absolutely. It, it was a, it was what, a solid. What, wasn't it wasn't a movie that, that we talk about very often. No, not at all. And it was shot by uh, cinematographer Oliver Wood. 
And what's crazy is that uh, just at pretty much the same time we were talking about that, he actually was passing away at, at 80 after a battle with cancer. Ooh. So, yeah. And it's particularly sad for me. Uh, I've known the guy for, for many, many years. I consider him a friend and he was a great uh, client of Hot Rod Cameras. And I uh, got to do a bunch of uh, work, particularly prep work for him on uh, movies that he was putting together. And a lot of people, uh, you know, if, if you're in the industry, you, you most assuredly are familiar with Oliver Wood. But if you're not, you are very familiar with his work. You just didn't know it. Uh, his big break came in 1986 when he shot a little show called uh, Miami Vice. And he was the primary cinematographer on Miami Vice oh, wow. for more than 50 episodes. So he springboarded from that into doing a lot of uh, better feature work. And he was the cinematographer on uh, on Cutthroat Island and fell off of a crane, broke his leg and had to be re- replaced. But at that time, it was a Rennie Harlan movie. It was a huge budget. And, you know, I think Gina Davis was the highest paid. He, he shot a Hollywood. bunch of Rennie Harlan movies. He shot like Die Hard 2 and The Adventures of Ford Fairlane. And it, 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 I, he, I, he really yeah. did. And he did some interesting sort of stuff, too. He did shot one of Ethan Hawke's earliest movies with uh, Terry Polo called Mystery Date. He shot all the uh, original trilogy of the the Bourne movies, uh, the Bourne Identity, the Bourne Supremacy, the Bourne Ultimatum. That was, that was all him. And he got a lot of uh, got a lot of attention for a very particular uh, style of shooting that those movies brought uh, into attention, this frenetic camera movement, especially during fight scenes and the like. Uh, He told me repeatedly that he would love to come on the show and would love to uh, talk to us, except that he didn't do interviews and he really regretted most of the interviews that he ever did. Yeah, I was going to ask, so, I was going to ask you why we never had him on the show. Yeah. Uh, I, w- I really would have liked to have had him on the show. Uh, unfortunately, it kind of like went against his personal uh, belief structure, which, you know, uh, I, I, I totally respect and I totally understand. Uh, it's a really uncommon person to hold so true to their, their feelings like that. And he, coming on the show, this would be a very safe place for him. So that he and I are friends, but I think he didn't appreciate the shameless self-promotion, which so many people these days are so quick to, to, to want to, you know, self-promote. And I think he was just very humble and, uh, you know, rather soft-spoken and just really wanted to do his own thing. And I think didn't want to be self-conscious about it. I think, I don't think he really wanted to be on camera and he didn't even really want to do, uh, you know, you, if you go back through like the, you know, American cinematographer, there's a story in there in 2007 that he did for Born Identity or Born Ultimatum. I think it was Born Ultimatum. I think I but, read that. Um, I think I recall reading yeah, that exact or, story. Yeah, but there isn't too much. It's a hard to find stuff about with Oliver Wood. Yeah, but that was like 15 years ago. I know. So, I'm yeah. just saying like, like it's like it's it's tough to find stuff yeah. about him, which is too bad. I think, that, you know, he will be remembered through his work and, uh, you know, his surviving family. But. And it's the loss. You know, it's not like he didn't have uh, a tremendous career and a, and a, a rich life at, at 80. But uh, I'm very sad to see him go. And I'm really sorry that uh, I have to bring us all down here with the story about Oliver Wood. But, uh, you know, I really feel like it was uh, important to bring it up now. And uh, if you know, look, there's so many great movies and he did tons of comedies. He did a lot of like Will Ferrell comedies like Talladega Nights and uh, Anchorman 2. And uh, I mean, really, he seemed to be uh, for a while too like the sequel guy. Like if there was a sequel to something and you needed someone who could like really continue the story, do a new style, raise the stakes. He was like the first call for a lot of people. He did Marvel movies, he did all kinds of stuff. He did like, you know, every level of, of movie or television you can imagine. And his IMDb lists it all there. And I'm sure that there is stuff there that, that every one of us has seen. Uh, his credits read like, a, you know, who's who of movies for the last, you know, 30, 40 years. It's, it's amazing. Yeah, that's a bummer. Well, and I'm, and I'm sad we never had him on the show, but, you know. Yeah, of course, but I, I knew that wasn't going to happen. I, I'm I'm sorry that I, uh, he won't just pop into to my office sometimes to uh, chat about you know whatever he was working on, and he would always uh, he'd give me like he'd give me prompts, he'd give me these different things. He's like, hey, Ellie, I'm trying to do this thing. What do you have that can kind of do this? Or how would you suggest I go about getting this shot from the backseat of his car? Like, you know, he, he he was a big proponent of using little cameras, like particularly like, you know, HDSLRs, now called mirrorless cameras. But in the early days of that, and you can see them in almost all of his recent movies, he used our modified cameras and PL mounts on the remake of Ben-Hur. He also uh, did, of course, for Two Guns and Anchorman. And, you know, basically... Every movie I think he made in the last 
five, 10 years had at some point, some sort of small camera or cutaway or crash camera or different sort of things. He loved to do it. And he owned several of those cameras himself. And he would have this kit. He just pull out, you know, Hey, I'm going to want an extra angle over here. Oh, this camera might get run over. That's okay. I'm going to put a camera over here. He was really into that. And ultimately when you, when you see the work that he does, he, he would tell me all the time like you, no one's going to have any idea that this shot in Ben-Hur is from a little, you know, $2,000 yeah. camera. No one's going to have any idea that the, that this shot is this. And it's really too bad. He really liked to uh, push the envelope and play with new technology and was uh, really savvy about all of it. It's, you know, I'm, I'm kind of crushed. I, I, I hope that uh, I don't really have too much to say. I just think that, uh, you know, I think he's a, a wonderful talent. I wanted to, to say something about him. And uh, I, I think that the number one thing we can all do is see something that he did. And he did all kinds of like lesser movies, too, that uh, don't necessarily get their due and look incredible, like stuff like Two Days in the Valley, which is just sort of like yeah. a insider. I love that movie. But it's it's incredible. And it's like Charlize Theron's first movie. Yeah, yeah, something like that. I mean, he worked with so many people throughout their careers and so many directors. I mean, he was working, last I knew, uh, pre-pandemic. So uh, he did the Morbius. Uh, he did, yeah. I think, he, yeah, he did Equalizer. He did a, a bunch of different things. So, yeah, I mean, he, he's going to be missed for sure. It's a real loss, but I'm glad we're able to memorialize him and hopefully uh, go revisit some of his work. Yeah. So, Ben, I think that just about does it for this episode. If people want to track you down, where can they find you? Go to BenRock.com. You can find all the stuff you ever wanted to know about me on BenRock.com and uh, links to all my social media. People uh, periodically will uh, hit me up on Twitter or LinkedIn or whatever because they I'm assuming they're finding me there. Ilya, where can people find you? Uh, you can find me over at Hot Rod Cameras, hotrodcameras.com. And uh, yeah, uh, hit me up if you uh, need to build a studio, if you uh, want uh, any sort of camera gear, uh, need a helping hand and want to uh, talk about technology. That's what I do. Go ahead and reach out through Hot Rod Cameras or my LinkedIn. That's a, a place that people have been finding me lately. Hey, uh, Alana, where can people track you down? People can find me at growwithgreentree.com, which is my website for my um, social media marketing company called Green Tree Creative. Awesome. All right. Hey, let's thank some people. Hey, Alana, do you want to do the thank yous this week? Yeah, thank yourself. Start by thanking yeah, thank, yourself. Start, start, start with yourself. <laughs> start by thanking. I thank big myself thank for stepping in for the doing the interview because Ben was busy working. <laughs> mm. Yeah, and in fact, anyone who what, who might not have been paying close attention last week, uh, there wasn't much in the way of host wraps for Jesse Feldman. Yeah. It's because Ben was totally unavailable. Mm. He had to go, like, make a paycheck. He had to go, like, direct <laughs> something, so... He had to be a director. You'll never know what it was either. It's a it's a, it's a mystery. <laughs> and we'll thank um, Kay Zalatrachi, who I have a long email I'm sending to to finally get our new music squared away because he had a lot of specific questions that I had to actually think about to answer. So. Is, is it going to be sort of like tiki lounge music? Because uh, he wants hungry. very specific ideas for what what we want. I kind of like the tiki lounge music, so you know, I don't know. I, uh, this is your, I see Ben giving a real skeptical yeah, face ben, right you now. You know, he, Ben Katz was in favor of some jazz. I'm ooh, like no, swingy jazz. No, <laughs> yeah, no. yeah, yeah. Oh, I think this is Ben this Katz. Is going you good and I will have to. Ben not Katz a, actually suggested some jazz flute. Uh, <laughs> some Jethro Tull up in here. All right. <laughs> so thank you also to Ben Katz, who, um, as no, usual, no, thank is you for the us, jazz, Ben Katz. <laughs> we don't like jazz. Actually, I think we're all in consensus on that. Wow, None we all actually, agree about uh, not liking I don't jazz. like jazz either. No. It's not just into jazz. So. Certain improvisational jazz, which is like kryptonite for me. It's it's really you know very. Specific. Yeah, yeah. I'm not like against like blues or Dixieland or something like like that. But like, oh my god, <laughs> you, you listen you listen to a lot of Dixieland, are you? Yeah, I, I don't. No, I don't. But like a bebop, like jazz noodling, like. Like, uh, it's just not my thing. I know people love it. I'm not trying to yuck anyone's yum. I just can't get it. I can't get behind jazz. All right. So I think that just about does it this week. Uh, Alana, you want to take us out? Thanks for listening. This has been the Cinematography Podcast, presented by Hot Rod Cameras. Find your next camera, lens, or accessory on the web at hotrodcameras.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our show on iTunes and connect with us on Facebook and Twitter. Thanks for listening.